they've gotten much better and much worse. Uh, much better in the sense that um, when I first sort of came out with the message of the book, it was still considered very socially unacceptable in most places for women to question or challenge or, or reject the idea that these norms coming from TV and film and advertisements um, were uh, the, the, the only standard or the right standard. Um, there was something wrong with you if you had questions about it. And now it's very mainstream, it's very commonplace. Um, you know, Seventeen Magazine and, you know, Girl Scouts and uh, very kind of mass market publications take for granted that we should teach girls good self-esteem and, and teach them to be, to be critical of these images and um, support them in having healthy body weight, whatever their, you know, natural shape. Uh, so that's good. And more women think critically about these matters. Um, What's worse is that the, actually the ideal has gotten even more deathly gaunt, which is incredible. I mean, you know, I, I sometimes look at, at fashion magazines now and I just feel frightened because um, it, you, you couldn't imagine that, you know, models could get, get skinnier, pardon me, you couldn't imagine that models could get skinnier than they were when I wrote The Beauty Myth, but in fact, that era looks like sort of the healthy Amazonian superwoman compared to now, um, when sometimes these poor young girls look like they've got, you know, one foot in the grave. So there's that. Also, the technology of computer imaging has gotten more sophisticated. So when I wrote The Beauty Myth, I was alerting to people to the fact that these images were retouched. Now they're literally generated um, sort of magically by computers so that they'll take a, a photograph of a real woman, but they'll um, then magically kind of stretch the torso, you know, expand the breasts, elongate the legs, uh, so that you're not even looking at a real human body anymore. Um, and that's important. And finally, technologies of cosmetic surgery have gotten much more um, widespread and more, um, I don't just want to say accepted, but more expected. Uh, so that's a challenge as well. Mrs. Clinton really foregrounded gender in a way that I think wasn't so helpful for her or for the issue. Um, she came about it, I think, in a very second wave kind of way, um, which was every time she experienced sexism, she cried sexism. And in an ideal world, I suppose you could do that, but um, it's not an ideal world. And it, I think it, it, it drove me away from being inclined to vote for her because it made me feel like she's not equipped to, you know, push through and rise above it and keep focused on um, the issues facing Americans. Uh, and the contrast to that was how Obama um, dealt with the issue of race, which is every time he faced plenty of racism, but instead of whining about it, he used it as a teaching opportunity. Gender was an issue also on the Republican side in 2008 because uh, McCain chose Palin as his vice presidential pick. Um, there, I think that was a really smart tactic theoretically because what they were doing was canceling out the gender advantage. Um, and even the Republicans realized belatedly that um, half the voting population is female, actually more than half. And the old right-wing reflexive sexism wasn't a winning strategy. Uh, so you did see during the Bush years more appropriation of fem feminism, basically. Um, I think Karen Hughes was responsible for a lot of this. And that was inevitable, a, a kind of cons conservative feminism, which is perfectly legitimate. Um, and so Sarah Palin, you know, there is a kind of right-wing feminism that she embodies, um, individualistic, uh, autonomous, libertarian, um, don't need the government to prop me up, uh, kind of earthy, working class mom figure. There are plenty of women in America who really identify with that. And to be fair to what was sensible about that pick, had she not been a lunatic, right? Um, they're all the women you see on the other side and most of the women you see in public life in the U.S. as well as in most countries in the developing world are uh, elite trained, you know, either elite born or elite trained. And so there is a void for a working class woman to rise to the top and speak on behalf of working class or lower middle class women. Um, so that was a smart move. Sadly, I mean, to choose someone in that direction, sadly they hadn't vetted her. Um, and so ultimately, you know, the gender advantage turned into a disadvantage that didn't have to do with gender so much as 
her being a very ill-prepared, uh, undisciplined candidate. When I was an undergraduate at Yale, I was uh, sexually, I'm going to say, moved in on by a very well-known professor, um, Professor Harold Bloom, in a context where he was supervising me in an independent study. And um, the reason I use that word rather than sexually harassed is that that law didn't even exist in 1983. Um, and there were no um, statutes against it in the university. So it happened. I mean, it was very widespread. Um, and what's important in my story is not the fact that it happened, but the fact that uh, when I tried to tell Yale about it, they stonewalled and got their lawyers in and covered up. And um, then when I did some more digging, I discovered that for 20 years, uh, long after that one experience that I had had, much more serious crimes had taken place at Yale. I mean, drugged rapes, you know, assaults, I mean, horrible things systemically that had been covered up by the university. And even worst of all, if your issue is hypocrisy, the university had a uh, fake grievance procedure. It represented itself as being where you would go if you were raped or assaulted or harassed sexually. But in fact, it was serving the administration. And its job was to stonewall or marginalize or silence the victim. Horrible. So, um, so I, I exposed that because all of my efforts to get Yale to fix their grievance procedure internally were to no avail, and I felt that I was honor-bound to protect other young women and young men coming up by going public with what I knew. If I were just whining and being self-pitying uh, and not doing anything about it, that would be playing a victim card. Um, if it were a self-interested whine or, you know, complaint, that also theoretically is what victims do. They use their uh, harmed status for their own advantage, um, but that wasn't my intention. I was behaving very powerfully uh, using the resources at my disposal and my work as a journalist and my access to national media to thoroughly document a pattern of abuse. I also want to explain something I've, I've learned looking at the history of the women's movement and just my own career. Um, and I have a gut feeling about this now, generally. Sometimes there's real criticism and you have to really listen to it and think about it, but sometimes it's tactical, right? And really that thing of, oh, let's call her something. Uh, okay, we'll call her, you know, she's playing a victim card. It's not, a, it's not real criticism. It's just tactical. It's just like, what are we going to use to stop this? Because I'm, guess what? I'm lucid, I'm articulate, I'm credible, I'm whatever I was, 45 years old. You know, so many women who have come forward have had the nuts or sluts attack. Um, either they can be represented as insane or represented as, you know, so sexually promiscuous that one more encroachment didn't matter. Um, and I think, in retrospect, uh, you know, that I was one of the first white, highly educated, upper middle class by now, um, didn't start out that way, but, you know, positioned in a place of privilege. Um, accomplished career woman to come forward uh, with a, an equally or probably more prominent man and say this happened to me. Um, I mean obviously there had been Anita Hill but she got just about destroyed and um, she was easily marginalized because marginalized she was African-American. Uh, you know there have been other women coming forward in the corporate world but I think that in my worlds, you know media and journalism, the academy, this did pose some kind of threat and um, of, of change or precedent setting. And I think it kind of did set a, a, a precedent not to, you know, uh, lay claim for myself, but to credit the people who came forward afterwards. I've noticed that many more women are coming forward, um, and men too, in uh, sexual harassment and sexual abuse situations in an academic context um, or with, uh, you know, supervisors or with um, uh, teachers. Um, so where am I going with that? So I, I don't think you can assume that criticism like that is actually thought out. It's sexier to have women fighting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I've noticed that again, 
again and again and again in my career. I mean, Camille Paglia attacked me, and then I made the mistake of attacking her back, and then the media just jumped all over it because um, I think there's a weird erotics to a display of you know getting women to fight. I, I don't mean a physical erotics. I mean like a cultural erotics. And also, you know, if they're fighting each other, they're divided and conquered, and that's satisfying if you're threatened by feminism. Um, and it's also just, it's kind of a form of, a, you know, cultural abuse, I think. I mean, it's extraordinary. Uh, you know, nothing in, the, nothing in any of my comments suggested that I, there had been a rift between us. Um, I had said nothing but how delightful it was to meet her and how much I enjoyed it. And, you know, yes, there had been that moment, but I still loved her. And, um, you know, nothing but praise. So it was kind of an invention of a rift. Um, and it's really, really ironic because it was, um, you know, this one moment where I was actually honoring a foremother, very clearly saying, you know, the lineage, you know, goes from you, thank you. And the culture is so resistant to that because that would mean institutional succession yep. um, for this idea. Um, so the headline was, you know, rift. You see the same bizarre thing um, with the framing of feminism itself in the mass media. I did um, a piece on women and happiness, and uh, there was some data that the media jumped all over that seemed to indicate that women were less happy uh, following feminism, right? Um, the data was distorted, but I wrote a piece about it, and my argument was uh, very pro-feminist. And when I went to talk about my pro-feminist conclusions on the Today Show in the US, the tagline or Chiron or whatever it's called was, um, is freedom crippling women? <laughs> you know? and it's, so you can sit there saying one positive thing after another. And just here in Australia, I can't even believe it. You know, your Today Show, bless their hearts. You know, it's this, you know, very nice woman interviewer who got her job because of feminism. Probably the qu questions were written by female producer who got her job because of feminism, but somewhere up the chain of command, there's a guy, you know, sitting there making decisions. And so the question they had to ask me was, oh, after all these years, you know, women are working so hard and they're balance work, balancing work and family. Do, do you think women just are mad at feminism? Do they just want to forget feminism? And it's like, where is this even coming from? It's coming from nowhere. It's invented out of whole cloth, but it's because you know, that just is more culturally satisfying and more maybe likely to draw eyeballs than um, let's have a story on, you know, how happy women are that they've got a bunch of choices in their lives. It's, it's, it's stunning to me. Boy, I guess I'm getting older because I notice in this interview I keep kind of laying claim to certain, you know, things I did, um, as if for the record. But, uh, well, one of the things I, I did, and many people did it at the same time, was at the end of the beauty myth, I m made up an assertion <laughs> that there was a third wave of feminism. Now, I didn't lie. I knew many, many women were ready to be part of a third wave, but there was no such thing at that time, and I'd never heard the phrase, uh, to my knowledge. And um, so I said it was out there, and, and I did that tactically as a branding strategy because, of course, with movements that are fermenting and bubbling up, if you name them, you, the media circles around the name, and then it creates a reality. Um, and then the third wave burst out all over. Other women, like uh, Rebecca Walker, also used the same phrase at about the same time. Um, but having, so it's better than having no third wave. Best of all, though, is to institutionalize feminism so that it doesn't come in waves, because if it comes in waves, then you have this thing that happens historically again and again and again where um, the intermediate generation forgets, and then they have to reinvent the whole damn thing from the start. Well, I don't, I wouldn't say the end of America was fueled by anger. The end of America, I can tell you very personally, was fueled by fear. I was very frightened when I wrote it. Um, and I wrote it to frighten other people or to get them to look at something very fear fearsome, which was the encroaching suppression of liberty in our country, which is still an active, active, active issue. And not just in the United States, Australia and Britain face the same kinds of 
you know, bizarre echoes post 9-11, the same kinds of crackdowns, the same kinds of demagoguing Islam, the same kinds of um, uh, heightening of rationales for stripping citizens of civil liberties. Um, so I would urge you all to be vigilant and, uh, you know, the rest of the developed world to be vigilant. We're not out of the woods. Um, so that was not anger. That was terror. <laughs> um, misconceptions wasn't written out of anger. It was written out of you know, love, I guess. Um, I don't, I don't see myself as an angry person. I, I, I think I write out of love, I mean, generally. Um, I mean, that's my motivation. Uh, but you may think differently.